I, I thought there were magical, wonderful things going to happen with little birds flying around, and there would be a great connection, and it would be every time I looked at him, I would just, you know, just melt in, into happiness and contentment. Not at all my experience at all. I was not going out when I first brought Park home. I was inside all the time. I spent a lot of time alone. I was not looking to get socialized or bring him out and be social. It was very difficult for me to speak with people and be around people. I was overeating. Um, I was not bonding with Park. Alright, go ahead and turn the lights on. I gotta get my bag. Alright. We actually didn't know it at the time, but she had something called preeclampsia. And, um, um, and I guess the doctors realized it as time went on. It was uh, mainly through blood pressure readings and blood work and things like that. And what they had to look for was when they, uh, they were afraid that um, her body would actually start uh, rejecting um, the baby. Whenever he went to sleep, I was supposed to sleep, but I wouldn't go to sleep because I was afraid he was, uh, you know, going to stop breathing. So I didn't sleep at all, which I'm sure had a lot to do with the depression, the postpartum depression that I was experiencing. My body had been through a major event with the kidneys and the preeclampsia, and I was recovering from that and not sleeping. I loved it. I mean, when she came up with the idea of shooting him in my pants, I was all about it. I thought it was the coolest thing ever because, well, I'm his dad, you know? And so I was... Uh, it had a, an obvious appeal to me to watch my son grow up and, and fill out my pants. <laughs> I've always acted off of instinct with my projects and with my photography, and I was acting off of instinct at that. I literally only needed something in each photo that was a constant, and I picked the pair of jeans, and Stephen agreed to let me have them, and we started the process. So that's my whole life on that table. It's kind of weird. My life in two dimensions. That's pretty sweet. It's hard to narrow it down to concrete detail, but I remember being on a couch and just jumping around, flopping around, and my mom telling me to settle down and you know sit still so she could take it. But I was just, I was just having a ball. I was doing what I wanted to do, and uh, I didn't really understand it as photography at that point but I would say that's probably the closest thing I have to a memory. Children have this amazing abandon and this uh, freedom that adults don't have. They're not caught up in their head yet, and they have fun with it, and they're very um, open and honest and honest. They're not putting anything on. They're not playing to the camera, and when they are, it's obvious and fantastic. For the longest time, that's all it was to me, you know, just something that happened once a year. Sometimes I didn't want to do it, sometimes I really did want to do it, it just depended. I think the quickest it's ever taken has been an hour, hour and a half, and sometimes it'll take up to two. Sometimes with breaks in between, you know, it just depends. Um, it's always been kind of an organic process. We don't plan it out too much. We just get in front of the camera and, sees what, and see what happens. One thing about Park that's always been a truth is he's connected with the camera from this age. Even, if you, the, even at birth, he stared right at it. His connection with the camera is, is actually quite amazing. 
Um, he has a look and it's a deep, he was, he's an, he ha, every time he looks at the camera, you want to know what he's thinking. He's an old soul. This boy has a lot going on behind those eyes. I remember very clearly sitting down at the kitchen table trying to tell a seven-year-old what was about to happen. And uh, uh, I remember telling him, and um, his huge tears welled up. And all he said, he just, I don't want a divorce. <laughs> um, so it breaks your heart. The divorce was difficult. Uh, I was lucky enough to have them remain relatively close so I could see both of my parents. But um, I think especially um, through seventh and eighth grade, that's when I kind of came to terms with what a divorce was because it happened early. Um, I was young when it happened, so I don't, I remember it, but um, it's fuzzy. And I, the realism of it didn't really hit until I was older. And this particular shot, I, I adore. He was very quiet. He was not in a, a good mood at all. He uh, sat in the chair and put his head down and put his head back, and that's about all he did. I love the picture. There were, he was sad. He was, this was the first one I think I remember him being melancholy. And um, this was around that time where Stephen and I were still trying to, you know, we were, we were separated and trying to figure out how to get divorced and be divorced, and I was depressed. It was a hard, hard time for me. I um, was lost. I was lost, and I had two kids, and I was trying to raise them, and Stephen was um, not present on a few le levels, and I was dealing with it. It was a tough time. Um, okay. Hang on. Whoa, it's gonna be a scorcher. Yep, good thing I got a black shirt on. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a good thing I've accidentally put three shirts on. Why? Uh, it was five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you have three shirts on? <laughs> you do, I have three shirts on. I woke up and it was You're like... You're gonna die of heat stroke. Yeah. The pants didn't hit me until he was about, I think it was 13, when he was still putting them on and okay about it. And he actually said, I believe it was the one where he had his iPod in his ears and um, he was listening to music while he was waiting for me to get ready and he had the pants on and he said, look mom, dad's pants almost fit me. And I hadn't understood that until that moment and then I started realizing this was a powerful thing that Park was going to have and this is possibly a powerful thing that I had ever asked him to do by doing this every year and being measured up in that way.
So I live, practice, teach, and build in Northwest Arkansas, uh, home of the Ozarks, uh, the home of Walmart. Uh, we like to call it the land of Bill and a billion chickens. Geographically, we're many ways located in the middle of nowhere, but uh, you know, more and more we feel like we're considered to be close to everywhere. Arkansas, I consider an environment of real natural beauty and simultaneously uh, one of real constructed ugliness. So abandonment, uh, erasure, nostalgia, exploitation, they're all aspects of this place. I think they sometimes contribute to that perception that uh, we're culturally and aesthetically impoverished, which is certainly in many ways right the opposite. But it is true that I live in a land of disparate conditions. It's not just a setting for our work, it's really part of our work. And I don't see it as a negative. In fact, I see it as a deep source of possibilities uh, uh, in direct engagement with the world as, we're, as it's given to us, in the, in the everyday world. And by choosing to stay for the last 24 years here, what we've been able to do is turn over the rock and discover the underbelly of our place, the visceral presences and the expressive character that really informs and sustains our efforts here. Now, I'm, I'm working from a very simple conviction that l architecture is larger than the subject of architecture. So what we try to do is look at the world around us with a wide-angle microscopic lens to generate ideas and actions from our direct experience with the everyday, between um, the ordinary and the extraordinary, between personal history and the history of our discipline. And what that demands of us is to be very careful observers of our place, of the, the geological, the biological, and always the, the cultural aspects of place, which has allowed us to develop a more bottom-up process that allows us to amplify the small things that manifest the large things. So in that line of thinking, we can say after uh, the great poet William Carlos Williams in his poem Patterson, is that there are no ideas but in things. I think this uh, as contemporary architects really helps us address some very critical questions. One is how do you engage the world without being consumed by it? And simultaneously, how do you enrich and dignify the experience uh, of your place for those who engage your work? I think that's something that a set of questions we continue to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And a large part of that is because we're very interested in demonstrating that architecture can happen anywhere, at any scale, in any budget. So we take on all comers, all projects, from the prosaic to the honorific, from a free health clinic to the new architecture school, uh, in an attempt to use design to develop a, a culture in communities where you were, typically wouldn't expect to find it. I think it's safe to say that most architecture isn't very good, and most good architecture is good enough for most days. But there is some architecture, some buildings, that should rise above the everyday. In many ways, I see our task as the task of recreating strangeness, uh, of developing a connection to our place that is singular and yet simultaneously universal, simultaneously local and yet having a global presence. Music has always been part of my family. Um, my grandma and her husband uh, moved from the rural areas to the city and they started a huge uh, kind of ensemble of traditional African uh, music from their region. It's called Katekwe. And they passed on that knowledge to their children, um, particularly my uncle. His name is Oliver Mutukudzi, and he is uh, quite a world-renowned African musician uh, at the moment, actually. And I just grew up with that influence. So I was born in Harare, Zimbabwe, which is the capital. Um, and I wanted to come and study in the US. I'm a biology major, but I, you know, I've always had other interests, music being one of them. So that's the reason I am here at Hendricks College uh, in the United States to study a liberal arts education. So my three uh, biggest instruments are the African marimba, uh, the Zimbabwean bira, uh, which is 
um, I, can't, I guess you could call it a thumb piano and uh, the West African djembe drum. I, I've been speaking English my whole life, but my primary language is Shona, my native language from Zimbabwe, and I feel like that's my heart language. Uh, so when I try and write music, it's extremely difficult for me to write a song in English. I've tried, <laughs> and all my music just ends up reverting back to Shona, and I think that's because that's coming right from within me. Uh, and growing up, that was something that was so natural that if one person were to sing or to play or uh, someone would always just... And it's always been the, fun uh, to have to explain what my songs mean uh, and, and re-explore that meaning every single time I, I play it. But I feel like music is such a universal language. I feel like people can empathize with my emotions even though they don't understand uh, what I'm saying. Ever since I came to Arkansas, I decided to kind of step out of um, my shell and, and sing. And I must admit, as a writer, it was easy for me to kind of transition into singing for an audience that ne didn't necessarily know what I was saying. And I think it's been extremely helpful for my music to come to the United States. And I'm, a, I'm Afrocentric. I am super African. <laughs> so I feel like playing traditional music uh, was kind of like a natural reflex for me as I was writing my own. The way I write and the way I try and compose my music has become more complex uh, while being in, in the United States. And I've tried to explore uh, themes in a more indirect way. In conjunction with being a student at Hendricks College, I'm also a master's student at, at uh, the University of Arkansas for medical sciences. After that, I definitely know that my plan is to go back and to uh, make some sort of impact. I got into uh, photography when I was in the Air Force during World War II. And uh, prior to that, I was an architect with my father. But I had a <clears throat> passion for photography. And when I came home from the service, well, then I told him that I wanted to open up a studio, which I did in 1945. Fifteen years ago, I became interested in good old pinhole photography, which I have pursued since then. For anyone who doesn't know what it's about, it's a, a small, very small hole, 
at one end of any kind of a container, which has a black inside. And the hole at one end will project whatever is on the outside through the hole into the opposite surface of the black container. Pinhole photography is the basis for all photography. It'll be about a 20 minute exposure. I use natural lighting all the way. I mean, window light and uh, no artificial light. The reason I use natural light is I've got six perfectly good windows that give me just about any kind of light that I want. It is more difficult and you have to go with it. You don't dictate that um, as you would if you use uh, incandescent light or flash. So it is somewhat of, of a challenge to be able to do that. But I enjoy that. It's just like I've had any number of, of uh, well-known photographers ask me, why in the world do you fool with a pinhole camera? I mean, you're going to an awful lot of trouble. Well, because I'm doing something that I enjoy, and <clears throat> I like my work better with a pinhole, better than I do with a glass lens. fortunate that my work has, has uh, caught on to the extent that it has. I thoroughly enjoy doing it. And if people like it, I think that's all the better. But if I had to depend on my work for a livelihood, well, it might make a big difference. I mean, it's just a good feeling to, to uh, be satisfied with what you're doing and you know, pick up a little change from it. There was a fence, thank heaven, between the cows and myself. And um, so when the majority of the herd, well, all of the herd except this one, walked off, and he stood there <clears throat> rather still and uttered defiance of what was going on, and I'm sure a bit of curiosity. So I thought, I've got to get this, and the meter showed that I was going to have to give it about a minute and a half or so exposure. So I was trying to keep him still, so I just stood there and stared at him. Move! Move! Don't move! And that's what happened. That's why I took it. He stayed there the entire time. Not too bad a negative at that. Ten years or so ago, I became interested in what we call alternative processes. And one of them was uh, to print with platinum or palladium. Now, uh, when you do that, you have to coat your own paper. If the uh, original paper you put it on was an archival paper, it will last forever. In doing platinum and palladium printing, you do not have the control in making the print as you would in a silver print because you cannot burn and dodge and that sort of thing. The negative has to be the best possible negative that you can get. And this is where you get, this determines the artistic end of it while the, the actual chemical end uh, is just a matter of more or less mechanics. In other words, um, putting it in the developer, rinsing it, putting it in the fixers.
still lives. I do study the light of the possibilities of it. Patience is really the bottom line of pinhole photography. And this is a challenge that, that I like. It would seem that one would want to uh, get through with the thing, especially when they're as old as I am, 78 and a half. But I, I sort of like the idea of taking it easy with it and letting it roll and then end up with something that I think is certainly acceptable and maybe even fairly good.